Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1980 film The Shining. Yes, The Shining. Uh, big, big, big fan of this film, and it's actually one of my favorite films, not just horror, but all time, one of my all time favorite films. Uh, so I've always been wanting to do a review of this. I knew I'd get to it at some point, but I just didn't know when. But now is the time because I'm planning on doing a review of Dr. Sleep. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do a review of Dr. Sleep, shouldn't I just watch The Shining first, do a review for that, then do an even better review for Dr. Sleep because then I'll be fresh with my knowledge from The Shining movie, which I hear it ties into, as well as the actual books by Stephen King. Because, um, obviously, The Shining is based off a book by Stephen King, but Stephen King hated the Sh Stanley Kubrick's The Shining because it deviated very far from his actual book. Now, I will say I haven't read Dr. Sleep or The Shining, so, sorry, I'm not, I'm not a big reader. My reading mode is more magazines. I do read some books here and there, but it takes me a really long time to get through a book, and uh, Stephen King's books are huge, so they're very intimidating for me. Um, I'm just more of a visual person, so just know that. So, obviously written by Stephen King, Stanley Kubrick, like I said, changed a lot. He's best known directing-wise for movies like Spartacus, Dr. Strangelove, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Clockwork Orange, Full Metal Jacket, and Eyes Wide Shut. All really good films, in my opinion. He did some other ones in addition to that. Um, one of these situations where he died much younger than, than a lot of people wish he would have because he was a very amazing directing talent. And it would have been awesome to see what else he, he would have ended up doing. So, sucks that he was lost when he was. Um, I knew he had started doing that film AI that I think Spielberg finished. Uh, I think he started it, I don't know how far he, get, he, he got, maybe halfway or so, and then Spielberg finished that film. I haven't seen that one, had Haley Joel Osment in it, but yeah. So obviously, Jack Nicholson is in this one. He's amazing. His performance is ridiculously good in this. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Uh, Shelley Duvall is in it. Her performance, not so great, but it, it's quite possible that that's because she had a terrible relationship with Stanley, Stanley Kubrick during the making of this film. Uh, she hated him pretty much because he did a lot of things to her, and it, I don't know, like, there have been reports that he he was crappy with her because he wanted to stress her out so it would help her acting for her typ typical character, but she got stressed out to a point where apparently she was, like, losing her hair. It, it was bad. So I don't know if part of her bad performance came from just having a terrible time on set. I can see that happening, but I don't like her performance in this, and especially when it's next to uh, how great Jack Nicholson was. It looks even worse. Um, Scatman Crothers in this. He does a fun job. He, he has a lot of fun with Dick Haller in that character. I really love that character. I hate the fact that that character doesn't get used more, to be honest, but I'll also talk more about that later. And then Danny Lloyd, who played Danny, the kid, in the film, which I will say I met Danny Lloyd in person at Mon the last Monster Mania. Um, and you can check out my review of that Monster Mania on my channel and... I'll, you know, I talk in there and I show you what I got signed by him and, you know, but basically he doesn't remember a whole lot from the actual shooting of the film because he was so young at the time. What he remembers most is the scenes of him riding around in the hotel on his big wheels, which look great. I love those scenes because they're, the way they shot him with the steady cam, just like following him, it's really cool. You don't know what's coming as he goes around turns and it just feels like a really cool exploratory adventure for the audience. And that's why I love those so much. I mean, the, let's just call it out right now. This film looks amazing. Like, it looked amazing in 1980. It looks amazing now. You know, I watched it on a DVD copy, and it still looks amazing. Like, I know this is remastered, but I, I know there's probably been a Blu-ray since that I should probably just buy a Blu-ray of this because it's one of my favorite films. And I will. Um, just haven't gotten to that yet. But it, even still, just on DVD, it looks ridiculously good. And that's because the directing is phenomenal. The cinematography is ridiculous. I mean, just the opening scene of like that panoramic, just like tracking shot of the car going up the side of the mountain is beautiful. It's breathtaking. Just everything about the visuals is unbelievable. One of the reasons it's one of my favorite films. But I'll talk more about the visuals a little bit here and there. 
So the budget on this film was $19 million, and it ended up making $46.2 million, which, you know, that's a good profit for 1980. I'm not going to say the back, back information on this. I'm not going to go into some of the typical stuff that people talk about with it, because a lot of people know a lot about The Shining, especially if you're a horror fan. A lot of information out there. So I just kind of wrote down some of the things that I didn't necessarily know when I was researching it. So... Um, I did know this, but it bears repeating that they shot the internal scenes on a, on a stage at a studio. Uh, the the o Overlook Hotel, there you can actually go to the Overlook ho Hotel, it's still there. But they only really use the outside of that. So, you know, it's probably why it was such an expensive film to make at $19 million in 1980. So, um, there were a lot of different length cuts of the film that, that had been, ended up being put out. I've only seen... I think one version of it, but I will say I actually have seen the film in the theater uh, at one point, which was one of the most amazing film experiences of my life. It was, it was life changing as far as my relationship with the movie, The Shining. I loved The Shining at that point, and my theater experience with it made it, it shoot up to being one of my favorite films. Period, because seeing it on such a big screen and being a captive. You know, you're not watching it at home. You don't get distracted. You're captive and you have to focus. Um, it makes the hotel feel like even more of a character and it feels like you're in it. It's it's amazing just to see it that large. And it's just, it's life changing. I mean, there may be places that put it back in the theater because right now when I'm putting this review out, this is the 40th anniversary this year of the release of The Shining. So... Maybe we'll get another release. I would love to get another opportunity to see it in the theater. That would be amazing. Um, yeah. Stephen King hates this version. There was a version that was made. It was like a, a mini TV series that was done much later um, in the 90s, I believe. And Mick Garris did that one. And Stephen King liked that because it was very faithful to the book. So um, I should probably do a revisit on that series. Because I remember watching it when it was on on TV back then, but I don't remember a ton about it now because it's been so long. So, um, a new version of Steadicam was actually used for this film, and so it was pretty innovative as far as, like, those tracking shots. And they actually had mounted the camera on a wheelchair and then, like, built some rigged stuff around it. Um, so, that was interesting. Uh, Kubrick apparently wanted to show the evil side of human personality. That was his idea behind specifically doing The Shining, and he found the best representation of that in Stephen King's book. Obviously, he changed it a bunch to fit what he wanted, but it was kind of reported that he was looking for a horror film to kind of showcase the evil in, in human personality, and he kept going through all these horror books and reading them, and when he would get done with one that he didn't find what he was looking for, he would literally throw the book at a wall because he was just like, ah, this isn't the one. But when he got to The Shining by Stephen King, he found what he was looking for. So, Kubrick apparently... Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I just read that. My bad. <laughs> Nicholson, Nicholson, Jack Nicholson was the first choice for the role. But there were other people who were considered for Jack Torrance. That included Robert De Niro. Would have been interesting. Robin Williams and Harrison Ford. Now, when you hear those names thrown out, you think, wow, that would be weird or that wouldn't work or whatever. But... You know, had it been those people, we may still view it the same. I don't know. But Nicholson kind of carries this film. It's amazing. This was actually shot in chronological order, which is super, super rare. They ended up building the inside sets uh, in a certain way that they could connect them so that they would have be able to shoot the film chronologically instead of, like, building a scene, doing all the takes there, tearing it down, and then doing another one. Um, it's Yeah, it's rare that films, especially professionally done films are shot in in chronological order but i have a theory that that kubrick probably did that because it helps with the acting of it like the characters could actually feel the changes in their character being done and, and more of the tension actually building so i think it's good for that reason that they would do it chronologically so there are um, some outtakes of the opening panorama scene, actually, you know, what I was talking about, like, the, the car going up the mountain road. Some of those outtakes were actually used by Ridley Scott later in his um, movie Blade Runner. I found that to be pretty interesting. I did not know about that. And here's one of the biggest problems, is, is that 
Kubrick, and this is probably where a lot of things spawn from with the tension between Duvall and Kubrick. Kubrick reportedly changed the script a lot and when they were filming. So like there would be days literally that they would show up and their lines had changed from the day prior. And it, it was said that, well, first of all, Shelley Duvall was very, very frustrated by this, but Nicholson was also frustrated, like to a point where he would get a new version of the script and apparently just immediately throw it away because he'd be like, tomorrow it's going to be different. So he would really, a lot of the times, just memorize his lines like right before he was going to do a scene. And you wouldn't really know that though because his performance is so good. His line delivery is great. But then again, like we're not seeing the outtakes too. Like how much of footage wasn't usable because of, you know, mess ups. I don't know. Um, yeah, obviously, like I talked about, this film looks amazing. It's un un unbelievable. And there are a lot of theories about this film. I don't want to go too much into some other theories that people have thrown out about it. I'm mainly picking things out that I want to talk about having to do with this film based off me just having watched it. I literally just watched it before I sat down for this review. And I just, w I just wanted to like kind of look at it through the lens of really, really deep diving into it. Now, there are a lot of subtle things that Kubrick does in this, and I don't want to get too far into the subtle things because there's a lot of speculation I know pe people have had online and in a, a documentary film called Room 237 that, you know, they seem out there. They seem like, okay, well, maybe, but we don't know for sure. It just seems like a lot of wild guessing. So I will give you some of my kind of wild guesses, my personal ones, and just see what you think. Uh, so the wailing noises that get incorporated into the music in the very beginning of the film, I think is really cool because it kind of sets you up to know immediately, like, there's something wrong. There's something ominous, something evil. And that kind of gets to the point that the music in this in general was really amazingly good. Uh, it matches the scenes extremely well. It's always very brooding and menacing sounding. Um, it just always sounds off. But that's good for the tension build because everything in this film is off in in a good storytelling way because things are messed up. Uh, they set up the concept of isolation pretty early and being trapped with the uh, with the job interview portion where Jack Nicholson's being interviewed for that position. Uh, and then when they talk about the tragedy that happened with um, Delbert Grady when he axed his whole family when he was the caretaker there. Um, that was really good of them to kind of introduce that immediately. And I'm a big fan, if you've watched enough of my reviews, you know, I'm a big fan of films that have isolation or films that have a situation where people are trapped in a confined building or space with an evil, because I feel like that ratchets the tension up a lot and I, and it really helps. It's just something I personally like. Um, notice that Jack has no real reaction to the ax murder details. Uh, which shows an odd comfort that he has with it, uh, which, you know, may actually spawn from the fact that they're they're showing that he has, you know, we know he has kind of an abusive past because Wendy talks about that to the person who comes to check out Danny after he has his seizure um, in the beginning of the film. And so I feel like him not reacting to the story of the axe murders was kind of a way of saying, of showing that he has a level of comfort with violence. And those types of things don't face him. Therefore, he has the ability to do it because he has that level of comfort. And obviously, that's where it ends up going. Although he doesn't actually kill Wendy or Danny, he does kill uh, Dick Halloran, which bothers me. But I'll get to that later. The scene of Danny talking to Tony in the bathroom is actually pretty disturbing. And it's partially because of the camera work that they do. That like very slow-moving shot that's moving in on him in the bathroom as he's standing there looking in the mirror. Like, him doing the voice of Tony is disturbing enough, but with that slow camera work and the music they have behind it, very disturbing. Very disturbing. Uh, the blood coming from the elevator scene, obviously this is iconic in the film. It looks amazing. It still looks amazing. And they do it a few times throughout the film, probably because it looks so good. It's such, it's such a great visual trick. Um, love it. It's obviously super iconic. Also the twins. The twins are super iconic too, which, you know, because they're creepy. When you first see Jack with the family in the car when they're they're going up to the hotel to move in, he's super disconnected. It seems like he doesn't have any interest in really being involved with his own family. Just notice that, like all the interactions, he feels very put off by the fact that he has to interact with his wife and kid. 
So you can see and feel the tension within the family. You can tell that it's not a tight knit family unit, that there's a problem. And we know that that spawns from the issue that was three years prior where, you know, Jack got drunk and he, you know, hurt Danny by like grabbing him really hard. But I just noticed that. But it also, that persists throughout the film. Just notice that he, for the most of the, most of the time, doesn't really want to have anything to do with Danny and doesn't really want to have a whole lot to do with Wendy either. He seems to be very happy being by himself and um, doesn't really care about his family that much, to be honest. And that's from the beginning. Um, the casual mention of the hotel being located on an, a, an ancient Indian burial ground that's an immediate flag for people watching movies now, but back then it was more of like a subtle hint at something being wrong uh, because, you know, Poltergeist, I think, was the one that really drove that stuff home, and I believe Poltergeist was in the 80s. I'm pretty sure Poltergeist was after The Shining. I could have looked that up, but I didn't, so someone go ahead and comment. Let me know what year that was. Uh, once Halloran talks to Danny about The Shining, it goes from seeming kind of disturbing and scary to actually kind of feeling comfortable and just like it's a special ability that Danny has. Because when he's just talking to Tony and he's getting these kind of like flashes of, of what could potentially happen in danger at the Overlook Hotel, it seems scary, it seems disturbing. But then when Halloran talks to him, it kind of puts, I feel like, not just Danny at ease, but also the audience a little bit. That's just how I feel. Uh, Halloran's explanation of The Shining gives the idea that bad things that happen echo into the future with people and also with places, uh, which is basically what ends up happening with the Torrance family with that, that abusive moment three years prior of Jack on Danny. That keeps echoing within that family, and it keeps resurfacing throughout the film um, because, I mean, it's, it's very well shown in the fact in the, the moment where, you know, Danny shows up and he's not talking and because he had gone into room 237 and that lady was there and he's not saying anything and Wendy immediately just thinks Jack hurt the kid. Like, she he hurt Danny. So that's something that it keeps echoing within the family and it's also responsible for the distance because it's that awkward thing that nobody's going to forget. It, so The Shining is kind of a very good... Um, metaphor for violence in a family or just tension or trauma or, you know, bad things happening because they, they stay, they keep echoing. The tracking shots of Danny on the big wheel are great because it's engaging in exploration. I already said that one earlier. Jack's comment about having been to the hotel before gives the idea that it pulled him into the hotel, that it kind of was speaking to him and was, it was, he's kind of destined to be there. He's already open to being evil at this point, so he finds a level of comfort at the hotel while Danny and Wendy are actually very uneasy with it. So there's a big thing here with the hotel controlling him. He's not perfect when he gets there. He's already He already has the track laid for him to get to a point of killing his family because he shows that level of comfort with the axe murder story. He's already been physically abusive at some point. So he's, it shows he's open to doing bad things. Then when the hotel takes over and probably recognizes this in him, it starts pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and then eventually grabs firm hold of him. Although there are times where he, he snaps out of it or almost snaps out of it. And I'll talk about those coming up. The biggest turn in Jack's actual character comes in the scene where Wendy, in, Wendy interrupts his typing and becomes very emotionally and verbally abusive. It's like him going back to that time three years prior where he was drunk. You know, he, he doesn't actually have alcohol in this, uh, but in his mind he does. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But he, um, yeah, that moment where she interrupts his typing and he doesn't want her to see what he's doing. He's like, you're breaking my concentration. He cusses at her. He berates her. Um, that's the biggest change in his character because prior to that, he's disconnected from the family and doesn't seem that interested, but he's not like outwardly mad or outwardly uh, emotionally or verbally abusive. And that's the moment where he actually happens and you're kind of like, oh, things are getting real. And that's where I feel like the hotel is really starting to really get a hold on him and, and affect his mood. 
for its time, the twin scene in the hallway was probably very shocking because it's creepy, and especially the fact that you end up seeing that flash of them actually dead with blood all over and the axe laying there. Uh, really good image. Uh, yeah, back then I bet it was super shocking. Jack talking to Danny in the bedroom is pretty disturbing because he seems nuts at that point. He seems very, very not there, and... Um, there's tension because at that moment you're kind of like, is he going to do something to him right here? Is he going to harm him? Because it seems like he could. And this goes to how great Jack Nicholson was in this role because he just, he plays like nutty, like amazingly. He plays menacing super well. He plays crazy super well. He plays evil super well through his expressions. Uh, just honestly, the fact that his eyebrows are pointy, like they have that point at the top, just makes him look that extra bit of crazy and evil. It just works. His look, his acting, everything, it, it works. When Jack wakes up from his nightmare, it's him sobering up and snapping back to reality. This is one of those moments where he kind of snaps out of the control that the hotel has on him. That's when he has the nightmare in the main room where he types that he killed his family. And it disturbs him. And you get this glimpse of him being scared and being normal. And, and like like I was saying, snapping back to reality. But he goes right back to under control of the hotel. Because the hotel capitalizes on Wendy at that moment accusing Jack of abusing Danny. Because that's when Danny shows up in the room. And he's not, sorry, he's not talking and his sweater's been ripped. And then she's like, you did something to him. You hurt him. And he didn't, and at that point, he's like, what the heck? And that just brings brings that trauma up again. It brings that terrible moment in the relationship up again. And then that drives him right back into the arms of the evil hotel because he's mad again. And he's like, I'm being blamed for this. I didn't do it. I love the ball, the gold room, the, bar, the ballroom. I love that scene. The first one when Jack Nicholson goes in and he starts having a drink with Lloyd, the bartender. He's not actually drinking alcohol at that point, but I think that's kind of a signaling that by him touching, you know, drinking the alcohol again, touching the booze again, that things are going to start getting really bad because that's taking it back to the, to what happened to get him to the moment of actually being physically, physically abusive with Danny. But it's also just a really awesome moment where you just get to see Jack Nicholson really have a fun time with delivering those really awesome lines. And it looks really good. I like how like the bar top lighting is and the lighting behind the bar it looks really, really cool. It's, it's wonderful. And then they have a, a scene later where the ball ballroom's more inhabited with people. That is also one of my favorite scenes. Just anything having to do with the ballroom. Love it, love it, love it. Something interesting to notice is that the incident when Wendy spoke of, of Jack hurting Danny was three years ago. And Jack says that himself as well when he's talking to Lloyd at the bar. Now, Jack also says that he's been sober for five months. He said that he's been on the wagon for five for the past five months. So this indicates that Wendy had said that he gave up drinking as soon as the incident with him hurting Danny happened. That's not true. It's revealed here then that Danny's been secretly drinking for a lot longer and he only gave it up five months ago which I don't know time wise that could line up with when he decided to stop being a teacher go isolate himself and try and write a book and he was driven to into the arms of the hotel so it's just kind of interesting to think about the timeline like that Halloran has an amazing summer home uh that thing is super nice looking I was like whoa that that's awesome uh, when Wendy says she wants to get Danny out of the hotel, Jack's reaction indicates that the hotel has full hold of him and there's no way they're going to be able to leave because that's when it jumps to that next level of him being physically menacing towards her and he's coming at her and that's when she has the bat with her and then she's swinging it and he's telling her not to and he said he's going to, he's like, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your brains in. I love that delivery of the line. It's amazing. So good. Uh, when Lloyd says, your money's no good here, orders of the house, he's saying the hotel wants Jack to drink. It's it's the hotel. The house is in the hotel. The hotel is ordering Lloyd 
to pull Jack in, to get him drunk. Well, to make him think that he's getting drunk. So it will loosen his inhibitions. It will make him more open to suggestions of the hotel, which you then see later with Grady talking to him when he's locked in the uh, pantry saying, you know, you haven't taken care of the situation. Uh, you got to take care of this. I'll let you out if you take care of this situation. So... Jack almost snaps, snaps back to reality when he meets Delbert Grady because the story he was told comes back to him, the one he was told in the beginning that he barely reacts to. But the hotel refocuses him on his family problems by saying that Danny is trying to bring Dick Halloran into their affairs. So it's that moment where he could have snapped out of it, and he was almost going to because he's like, Delbert Grady, and he starts pressing him about being the caretaker and the axe murders and stuff like that. But then Grady is so good, Grady, the hotel, is so good at refocusing him on his issues with his family that he just forgets that then and doesn't snap out of it. I think that when Tony takes over, it's because he's trying to protect Danny. The moment where, where he says that Danny's not there anymore to Wendy, um, I view it as Tony was trying to take over Danny to hide Danny's consciousness because things were getting bad, so to kind of protect him. I don't know, just a theory. I hate that Halloran gets killed so fast. This is something I was talking about, not being used. So they spend so much time in the film on Halloran checking in, feeling like there's something wrong, flying there, getting the snowcat, going up to the hotel, getting in the hotel, looking around, and then he just immediately gets killed. He doesn't get to do anything. And so I feel like they spent so much time on that that when he gets killed that fast, when he shows up at the hotel, it's like all that was for nothing. It was just wasted. And that's one of my biggest issues with this film is that's just dumb. I feel like Dick Halloran should have been used a lot more and used more effectively because he was a cool character. He was a very cool character. Uh, what really is Jack's job at the Overlook? Because <laughs> you never see him doing work. He's only doing his typing and hanging out and, you know, throwing a ball against the wall to try and, like, get some ideas going. But he never does work. He's supposed to be the caretaker, and he doesn't do anything. So I just thought that was kind of funny. It dawned on me, like, he's supposed to be the caretaker. He doesn't do anything here. Unless it's just assumed that we just don't see those mundane things. But I feel like they would have showed, like, something. Uh, the moment Wendy sees Jack's writings, you realize he's not been sane the whole time he's been there. But then it brings up the question, does Jack know that he's just been writing over and over the same thing? Or in his mind, because he's under control of the hotel, is he thinking that there's actually a, a story there, a book? I don't know. That's just a question. It came up when I was watching. I was just like, huh, this is interesting to think about. Jack's overly sarcastic mocking of Wendy is actually pretty funny, and that's actually at the moment where things, like, really ramped up, and he was, you know, getting violent and saying he was going to bash her head in. Like, the the sarcastic mocking of her was over the top, but it was funny, but it was also, like, menacing and scary at the same time. So I just really like that scene. The red rum portion of the film was probably very shocking at the time. Uh, it's not anymore just because the film's so well known for it. Um... And also, like, don't you already see it coming in the film, though, too? Like, you know that at that point that um, the hotel's trying to get Jack to do something terrible. I mean, I guess it's just a thing where you don't know that he necessarily will, and then the reveal of the red rum being murdered backwards is that it will happen. Like, it's a premonition that Danny's having because of The Shining. So, they originally shot the axe uh, through the door scene with a fake door, just so people know. And they ended up having to go to a real door because Jack Nicholson had been a volunteer firefighter at one point. So he was very skilled in swinging an axe at a door. So when they were using the fake door, he went through it so fast that they were like, it's got to slow down. We're going to use a real door. I just thought that was an interesting fact. The outside maze scene looks so freaking good because the snow looks really cool. The lighting that they did with it is amazing, especially like the long shot down the hedge maze where um, you're seeing from the back of, of Jack uh, like kind of hobbling because he's injured with the axe and the light in front of him just kind of lighting it. So it, he's just like a silhouette and the snow laying there. It just looks so good. It's like a blue light because of the snow there. It's amazingly good looking um and the steady cam helps out with the maze portion it makes it look really good 
The close-up of Jack frozen and dead is a phenomenal visual. I love that. And it's a little bit funny, too, because his eyes are rolled up in his head. I just like that little that little touch. Um, Jack showing up in the old photos uh, plays to me like the hotel has basically claimed his soul. And he was kind of always destined to be consumed by that hotel. You know, my wife was watching the film with me, and she was like, so was he a ghost the whole time? And I was like, no, no, he was real. It's just, I think that since he died because of the hotel, like it sucked him in, it got a hold of him, and then he died, it then claimed his soul. And him showing up in the photos is showing that he's basically been added to the collection of other ghosts, of other souls that now live in the hotel. So that's just my interpretation. It's a personal interpretation. The level at which the hotel is a character is amazing, and I've not seen it done this well since. Having like an actual location be a character in a film, the hotel is definitely a character in the film, and it's amazing. And like I said, in the theater, it's even better. The music is so brooding and menacing. I already talked about that. Uh, the methodically paced falling apart of Jack's character is great because it feels kind of real. I mean, obviously, it, it's more of like demonic forces type thing, but it feels real for what 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 environment's been created for the story, what world has been created. Uh, the influence of the hotel on Jack gives you the idea that it wasn't the alcohol that made him abusive before. It was something much deeper and darker. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, Kubrick looking for a story that would that would play off the evil of human personality. I feel like that's where it was really going with it. It's not a problem with the alcohol, which is how Wendy explains it. It was, oh, he just drank too much. It was an inherent problem with his psyche. It was something that, that unlocked, the alcohol unlocked for him. That's terrible. So, does, so here's a question. Does Jack have The Shining? Because it seems that only people who have it can see what other people and places communicate through. The Shining. Also, it seems familial. So, while I was watching it, until I realized that at the end, Wendy ends up seeing things, um, she doesn't see anything for a while. Now, my question is, does Jack have The Shining because he was so susceptible to The Shining from the Overlook Hotel? Because they lay the track for, you know, Danny having The Shining, and therefore he can communicate through The Shining with H Halloran, and Halloran explains that to him that, you know, people can have The Shining, but also places can have The Shining. So that got me thinking that, oh, okay, because that's the case, maybe Jack is so susceptible to the Outlook because, or the Overlook, because he has The Shining and the Overlook has The Shining, and that's how the communication is going on. Now, that's a little bit busted up when later, um, like I said, I realized that Wendy was starting to see things at the end. But that doesn't mean that he he didn't have The Shining, though, because the other thing is Halloran had said that I believe his grandmother had The Shining as well, which leads me to believe that it's a familial thing, that it's passed through genetics. So Jack could have had The Shining. And like I said, I feel like that, if he had The Shining, that made him more susceptible to, um, you know, the wiles of the hotel. So, you know, because things would seem more real in that sense to him. Uh, the presence of, of, of all the Native American designs in the hotel are kind of play like they're the spirits of Native Americans because of the burial ground that was there. It, it's a good way to visually show that uh, even though the burial ground was moved, the spirit is still there. And, it, and it's a weird thing, honestly, for, for a hotel to have moved an Indian burial ground and then have a bunch of decoration from that culture. Uh, a little weird. But for the film, it works. Um, and then I have to, kind of the last thing I need to tell you, I, I have to share with you. I had met Robert England uh, at a Monster Mania f a year or two ago. Um, I think two years ago now. And he he and I got talking somehow about um, the uh, about the Shining. Well, actually, I remember how it happened. Because I was talking to him about an interview he did for the postmortem podcast with Mick Garris. And then he started talking about, oh, I love Mick Garris. And he's like, oh, you know, Mick Garris did a made for TV series of The Shining. And then he started talking about how Stephen King hated Kubrick's The Shining. And it was just really cool that Robert England, one of my favorite screen villains, was talking to me about one of my favorite horror films or one of my favorite films, period. 
Um, but he had an amazing quote that I want to pass along to everyone about it. He was talking about the big difference between the book and the movie, and that was that um, before, in the book apparently, before Jack Torrance goes to the Overlook Hotel, he's a good guy. There's no indication that there's any problems with him. There wasn't the abuse prior to getting there. Now, obviously, in the movie, he had some evil tendencies. He had the abuse. He had a drinking problem and all that. So the way Robert England explained it is, he said, in the movie, before he goes to the Overlook Hotel, the devil already has one finger up his ass. And I just, I thought that's a really funny quote, but it's a cool quote too, especially because it came from Robert England. Uh, so I will never forget that. And I wanted to pass that along to everyone out there. So anyway, I think people can probably guess what my rating on this is going to be, but out of five stars uh, with half stars in play, it's a five star film. This film's amazing. There's a reason people talk about it all the time. It's highly, highly lauded. Rightfully so. It holds up so well. I love this film. I love watching it every time I watch it. Um, it's phenomenal. It is truly. So thanks everyone for checking this out. And I will be doing, like I said, a review of Dr. Sleep, uh, pretty much after, right after I've recorded this, I'm going to go watch Dr. Sleep for the first time. So I'm very interested to see how things end up coming together and then I'll post a review. So it should be on my channel. If you're not watching this, if you're not watching this review, the day I drop it, my Dr. Sleep review is probably on the channel already so just letting you know that so anyway put some comments down there let's talk about the shining um and just horror stuff in general please do me a quick favor hit that subscribe i'm sorry this video has gone long but the shining's long but please hit that subscribe as a way to repay me for doing these videos because i don't make money that's your way to encourage me if you've already subscribed thank you so much and just hit that like button to just let me know you're still watching and you still enjoy it but thank you so much for sinking your time into this as it's almost 40 minutes long. I appreciate that. And until next time, keep it brutal.